Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. So glad you're with us for the Wednesday Three Martini Lunch. We're brought to you today by the Headspace app. Good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today. But uh, Jim, we can't start today without mentioning that even with students not even showing up to school in person. There are virtual snow days, which on the one hand is crazy, but it's also good because I do want that to be a tradition that that continues. But it is kind of weird that uh, when you don't leave your house to go to school, you still don't have school. Yeah, right now in Authenticity Woods, it is coming down. I was just outside and it's less than an inch, but it's, it's starting to accumulate on the roads and such. And both the boys, you will not hear them because they're upstairs in their room attending school the way they should. Um, but yeah, my attitude is like yours. If it actually had, you know, snowball-worthy snow, then sure, I'll give the kids a day off, you know. You, you weren't doing much learning anyway. So. Yeah, I think some of these superintendents, like you said, for your county, they're still in, in school. Others uh, are not, including our county. I think some superintendents just have this knee-jerk reaction of snow in the forecast, code red, no school. There you go, yeah. Well, if it's snowing, there no education can happen. <laughs> And admittedly, maybe the kids are just all staring out the windows right now. So Yeah, hopefully they are. Hopefully they are. Our kids have certainly been outside today. Uh, all right, let's get to our good martini, Jim. And this goes back to Eric Swalwell and Fang Fang. This is courtesy of the Free Beacon. Uh, Congressman Jim Banks of Indiana and Chip Roy of Texas, along with 15 other House Republicans, drafted a letter Tuesday to Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi calling for Congressman Eric Swalwell's removal from the House Intelligence Committee due to his ties to a suspected Chinese spy. The letter details both the compromised nature of Swalwell's position, given his personal relationship with alleged Chinese spy Fang Fang, in addition to the double standard from congressional Democrats regarding foreign interference in American politics. Quote, Speaker Pelosi spent four years yelling about President Trump being compromised by Russia, despite never having evidence to support her claim. Well, now we have proof our foremost adversary compromised a lawmaker who regularly handles highly classified intelligence, Banks said in a press release. Quote, Speaker Pelosi needs to step up, put country over party, and call on Congressman Swalwell to resign from the House Intelligence Committee. Swalwell failed to disclose to the Intelligence Committee his working relationship with Fang, who gained enough influence with the California Democrat to place multiple interns in his office and befriend Swalwell's brother and father on Facebook. In addition, Swalwell chairs one of the four subcommittees on the House Intelligence Committee. The letter is signed by some prominent Republican members, including House Minority Whip Steve Scalise and Conference Chair Liz Cheney. So, Jim, I assume Pelosi is going to ignore this, but uh, I think it's a pretty reasonable request. Oh, absolutely, Greg. The other day, um, the notorious Kurt Schlichter was guest hosting the Hugh Hewitt program. And he asked to have me on, and I appeared, and I think Kurt had about a million double entendres <laughs> that he wanted to use while describing the interaction of Swalwell and Fang Fang. And look, we don't know with 100% certainty that they <clears throat> knew each other in the biblical sense. That having been said, he has not answered whether he knew her in the biblical sense. And if the answer was no, you figure the guy would say no. He'd be pretty quick about it. Even if the answer was yes, a lot of guys would say no in this situation. And the fact that he's not saying no in this situation makes us strongly suspect that the answer is yes. Now, does this mean uh, Swalwell necessarily gave her anything of value? No, you know, yeah, that, that was earlier in his career. Uh, it did overlap at some point when he was in Congress. So this isn't just back when he was in his uh, uh, serving in local government. I think some, look, it is not a crime to have a sexual relationship with someone who is an agent of foreign intelligence. It just says uh, bad judgment. You know, it, it reflects badly. And I think there should be some consequence for this. You know, would I like to see Swalwell leave Congress? Sure. But I don't think the punishment fits the crime in this. But I do think stepping down from the House Intelligence Committee strikes me as a very reasonable consequence for Swalwell's bad judgment. Again, we don't know if she ever behaved in a certain way that, uh, that should have aroused suspicion or, but I, I just did it myself. Double entendres happen even when I'm not trying. Anyway, Swalwell, you know, it, it, Swalwell has not handled this well. Initially refusing to answer any questions. And then the one interview he did do, he said this was all being, you know, him being targeted because he's anti-Trump and all kinds of nonsense. No, 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 look. He made a friend that he was not supposed to make and that he probably should have been a little more careful about Give him credit where it's due, at least according to that Axios article. The FBI gave him a defensive briefing, and he uh, 
uh, cut off contact at that point. Great. You know what? There still should be some sort of consequence to this. You've demonstrated bad judgment. It's time to get off the Intel committee. Pelosi can put them on all, there's a whole, put them on national parks or something. Put them on something with no national security ramifications and let them do his job there. But uh, he basically wants to have this revelation have zero ramifications whatsoever. And I'm sorry, Congressman, that's just not the way life works. No, that's exactly right. There are consequences. You don't have a right to be on a committee. You're assigned that. It's a privilege to serve, particularly on the Intelligence Committee. And, uh, you know, Jim, in addition to making sure you're not compromising national security, you should have some intelligence when serving on the Intelligence <laughs> Committee. And so, I mean, there are a lot of people who say that's been optional for a really long time. <laughs> yes. But, uh, you know, it's also a canary in a coal mine situation, though, too. I mean, Swalwell is probably kind of the low-hanging fruit here. Uh, but uh, if you are a political figure of any clout at any level or even just a, a regular person who might have access to some sensitive information, you know, pay attention to who suddenly has interest in talking to you about various things. It's obvious that... Uh, China's becoming more aggressive in this area. There was a story out of Australia in the past uh, several days here that there are 2 million members of the Chinese Communist Party embedded at various levels in politics, business, entertainment all around the world. So uh, they're not being shy about this. They're being very aggressive. And, uh, you know, keep your head on a swivel and uh, keep your mouth shut. But... <laughs> We're not trying here, folks. It just that, happened. Yeah. That was not intentional. But, uh, you know... Keeping your head on a swivel, part of that, you can keep your head uh, focused in, in a good way, and that's where the Headspace app can come in. Look, life can be stressful even when the Chinese communists aren't trying to infiltrate your life and national security. 2020 has been crazy in so many different ways, and if you need stress relief that goes beyond some quick fixes, check out Headspace. Headspace is your daily dose of mindfulness in the form of guided meditations in an easy-to-use app. Headspace is one of the only meditation apps that is advancing the field of mindfulness and meditation through clinically validated research. So whatever the situation, Headspace really can help you feel better. If you're feeling overwhelmed, Headspace has a three-minute SOS meditation for you. If you need some help falling asleep, Headspace has wind-down sessions that their members swear by. Headspace's approach to mindfulness can reduce stress, improve sleep, boost focus, and increase your overall sense of well-being. As we've mentioned before, the uh, chief of operations here at Radio America is uh, very high on Headspace. He says that a lot of other folks at Radio America have used the app uh, this year with all the stress going on. It's helped them sleep better, helped them keep their focus, uh, stay in a good mood. And so he, he recommends that you check it out. Headspace is backed by 25 published studies on its benefits, 600,000 five-star reviews, and over 60 million downloads. So uh, you deserve to feel happier, and Headspace is meditation made simple. Go to headspace.com slash martini. Headspace.com slash martini for a free one-month trial with access to Headspace's full library of meditations for every situation. It's the best deal offered right now, so head to headspace.com slash martini today. All right, Jim, let's move to our second martini. I said good, bad, and crazy at the beginning. Uh, this one is actually a second good one in, in a couple different ways. AOC has told The Intercept uh, that she thinks it's time for Pelosi and Schumer to step down. However, she doesn't know of anyone who's actually in a good position to challenge them, so she knows that that's not going to change, at least over the next couple of years. Pelosi has indicated this will be her last two years as Speaker. Uh, Jim, if the 2022 midterms look anything like the 2020 uh, House races, she won't have the option of being Speaker come 2023. But uh, uh, I think this was part of the deal she made to avoid a major challenge after Democrats took over in 2018. But it's interesting what uh, AOC is saying here, because I think she actually has a point, which is not something I can say about her very often. She says the reason it's hard to mount a challenge and that folks on the more moderate side of the Democratic Party, if that still exists, have failed in their challenges to Pelosi is because they can't get any traction. And the reason for that is that no one's being groomed to replace Pelosi or Hoyer or Clyburn, all of whom are 80 years old and older. And a lot of that is because so much power is concentrated in those leadership positions. And you hear folks on the conservative side of the Republican Party saying this too, Jim, you know, by the time spending bills or a COVID relief bill gets to the floor, it's all been hashed out by the White House and a couple of congressional leaders in both parties. And then it's just take it or leave it for the rank and file. And so it's hard to kind of build up your ability to negotiate, build coalitions, bring people together, prove you're the kind of leader who can do these things. And so 
uh, as long as that's kind of the way the work is done on the, the big ticket items on Capitol Hill, uh, it's going to be hard for somebody to, to kind of shine and show that they are ready for that sort of position. So, you know, we want Pelosi and her ilk out of leadership as soon as humanly possible, but it's kind of hard to know who should replace them when they haven't had a chance to prove themselves. You know, Greg, I'm sure I've been wrong about a lot of things in life, but one of the things that I've been right about in life, and I think a lot of conservatives have been right about in life, like, like in, a, in a way you could almost define conservatism as being right about something before it's considered okay to be right about something. <laughs> and you can think about that as everything from Mitt Romney declaring that Russia is our preeminent geopolitical foe and Barack Obama saying, oh, you know, uh, the 80s called, they want their foreign policy back. <laughs> and then it turned out, well, actually, no, Russia really is a very eminent, if not the preeminent geopolitical foe uh, in the modern era. Maybe you can argue China, but, uh, you know, Russia was, you know, after, after the, the Russian influence of the 2016 election, a lot of Democrats were like, oh, oh, no, you're right. It's okay. Putin, Putin's a really bad guy, and it's perfectly okay to be opposed to him and to see Russia as a threat. Uh, and we can go through this on all kinds of issues from... Um, Greg, did you know Hunter Biden is a shady guy? No. And he's, and he's in legal trouble? Like, like, if you said this before the election, oh, you're some new, nutty Chris conspiracy theorist, and oh, you're picking on a drug addict, and all that. And now, lo and behold, all of a sudden, it turns out, yes, he is under FBI investigation. Right? Well, for a really long time on this podcast and, and on all kinds of conservative podcasts and columnists and such, we pointed out that Nancy Pelosi is pretty long in the tooth, and she could be arguably not a terribly effective leader. Um, now, if you read not just the mainstream press, but in a strange way, a lot of the, the press that specializes in covering Congress, you will find one profile of Pelosi after another. She's had a few biographies written about her, and they all look at her, and they all portray her as this master of the House of Representatives and this super strong leader and the icon of her party. And yet, whether it's, you know, the... Um, the incident with the hair salon or tearing up the State of the Union speech behind Trump or lashing out at Wolf Blitzer as a Republican agent or, you know, uh, you have to pass the bill to see what's in it. I mean, there's, there's just this long history where I, I can see the appeal of an Obama type, right? I, I could even kind of see the appeal of Biden, even though he's not my cup of tea. But Pelosi and Schumer? Like, does any, you know, unless you are in San Francisco or in New York, does anybody look at them and say, wow, those are fantastic leaders. I, I can't wait to, to metaphorically march into battle behind them. They are terrific, right? So now all of a sudden, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez comes along and she's observing, hey, they're kind of old. They don't have a great record. They're not great at communicating. And they're holding on to their power and they're not allowing another generation of younger Democratic lawmakers to uh, pep the torch or carry the baton or any other metaphor you want to do there. So on the one hand, like, I'm really glad a AOC is saying this. I think she happens to be right about this. And I'm glad because by her saying it, all of a sudden, it's now okay, right? It's no longer a crazy right-wing conspiracy theory. And that, oh, by the way, maybe we can put the idea that all of these glowing profiles of Nancy Pelosi in the last couple of years have been source greasers that have basically been there to suck up to the Speaker of the House um, and that actually do not reflect the fact that she's always playing four-level chess and one step ahead of McConnell and Trump, and, and she's always, no, no, you know, she's, um, she's as flawed as anybody. And in fact, she's probably particularly flawed because she is, you, I would say she's easily caricatured by Republicans. But Greg, she kind of is the caricature of Republicans. <laughs> she really does literally live on billionaire's row in San Francisco. She really is a San Francisco liberal. She really, and the other thing is I keep, every time she gets to a Q&A with reporters, she has that frozen in fear, deer in the headlights look on her face. And it's always this defensive, you know, I'm not going to talk about that. And you're, you're repeating Republican talking points. So she, she just seems to get flustered on a regular basis. So AOC, this is not something we say in this podcast very often, but hey, you've got a point there. And it'll be really interesting to see if Democrats listen to this argument, because it seems pretty, pretty evidently true, uh, or whether they stick with it out of a fear of Pelosi. And maybe she really does know where, like, you always hear, oh, well, you know, they keep her in charge because she's a good fundraiser and she knows where the bodies are buried. Greg, is that last part literal? Does she know where like members of Congress have killed people and where they buried the bodies and that's why she keeps uh, getting to be reelected as speaker? Yeah. Anyway, we'll see, Greg, but hopefully change is coming. 
Yeah, yeah. Don't forget about the freezer and the ice cream. Ah, yes. uh, <laughs> kind of out of touch too. But speaking of which, she, you know, the, the leadership kind of freezes people out of uh, spending debates and uh, other other major ticket items, like I said before. And that's one of the reasons our deficit keeps spiraling out of control. We haven't had regular order in the budget process for a very long time. Not that we had a balanced budget even when we did, but uh, that definitely hurts. And uh, just to let everybody know, no one in Washington is playing three or four dimensional chess. Nobody. Uh, everybody's in it for trying to accumulate power. And uh, Nancy Pelosi was very good at that. She does know people's weak spots, and so she can get them to do what she needs them to do and then let whoever she can uh, vote against legislation to try and keep their seat. I mean, that's kind of the way it works. <laughs> you, you, you line up the votes you need, and you release the votes you don't uh, if, if it helps them win re-election. That's kind of how it works. It's not genius. It's just politics. Hi, I'm Sarah Carter, host of the Sarah Carter Podcast. Everywhere you look these days, we're seeing an aggressive effort to destroy what made America great, tearing down our history, attacking our freedoms, and canceling any person who dares to cross the progressive speech police. We cannot stand by and let this happen. It's time for the silent majority to become the unsilent majority. Join me on the Sarah Carter Podcast. Subscribe at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, on to our crazy martini now, Jim. And vaccines have been available for what? Two days? 24 hours? 48 hours? Something like that. And already we have inequality in how they're being dispensed. Uh, Agence France Press and NBC accusing the Western world of hoarding the vaccine. Uh, First AFP, at least a fifth of the world's population may not have access to a COVID-19 vaccine until 2022, according to a study published Wednesday with wealthier nations reserving more than half of next year's potential doses. With hopes that vaccines can bring an end to a pandemic that has killed some 1.6 million people, countries including the United States, Britain, and the UAE have begun rolling out immunization programs. Wealthy nations, accounting for just 14% of the global population, have pre-ordered just over half of the vaccine doses expected to be produced by the 13 leading developers next year. This according to Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. NBC News, not to be outdone, the U.S., Canada, Britain, and the EU have pre-ordered enough COVID-19 shots to inoculate their population several times over, subject to regulatory approvals. In this critical game of medicine logistics, where supply is small but demand immediate and universal, campaigners and some officials accuse these wealthy nations of snapping up orders and hoarding more than they need. Jim, my quick response to that is, uh, we paid to develop this. Uh, We're paying to buy them, and I'm guessing once uh, we're in good shape, we'll be in better shape to help everybody else. Yeah, Greg, I was going to observe that um, when when this vaccine is provided to poorer third world countries, how much will the United States be charging them? Not much. Right? Minimal or none. So the argument is that the United States is providing a life-saving vaccine at minimal cost or no cost, but it's coming late. That's that's the that, that that's the real objection there, right? That you know, it's not. We should be first in line, by virtue of existing, ahead of your your own citizens, I guess, right? You know, look, it, it, nothing's going to turn me more into an America firster than <laughs> something like this. Whereas, like, look, this is one of the advantages of being a first world country. And oh, by the way, some of this resources, look, some of the poorest countries in the world have plutonium, gold, oil, uh, abundant natural resources, uh, natural gas, uh, all kinds of stuff. They are not wealthier, and they do not have more abundance, uh, resor- abundant uh, uh, cash flow, because of the, you know most of these most of the countries, the third world countries of the world, are not free countries. The government more or less controls the economy, and they are in many cases kleptocracies. Right, the government takes control of everything, and seizes all the money for themselves. And lo and behold, most of the people are living in poverty. That's the problem. There, it's not that we're mean. It's not that we're greedy. It's not that we're selfish. And oh, by the way, where are they coming off the, the assembly line? Greg, there's a particular great state in this country where the, the vaccines are rolling off the assembly line, correct? Yes, Michigan. Woo. Right. We're lucky Michigan isn't keeping it all for itself, right? We're <laughs> lucky that we saw that FedEx plane. We saw the trucks. They're going out all across the country. If this, you know, if the United States has developed a vaccine, they are more than entitled to vaccinate their own people. That is, you know, that is a, 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 a hard truth about the nature of the world going back to the beginning of time, complaining about it isn't going to change it. You're not going to guilt Americans into giving up their vaccine for somebody else. They're producing it as much as possible. And let's keep in mind, it has been largely, with the exception of Oxford, I guess, is Oxford state run, I suppose? It has has been private companies 
is evil pharmaceutical companies. We're always being demonized by our politicians who pulled together some of the best minds in the world and figured out, look, you know, at this point, we've got one. Another one is on the verge of approval. The Oxford one is a few weeks behind. And Johnson & Johnson looks like it's going to be, you know, they've got enough people for the stage three testing by the end of this week. We're going to have four vaccines come along. Now, did the Europeans help with this? Sure. It's been a worldwide effort. We intend to get this vaccine everywhere. But it is not surprising that the uh, countries that have put the most into the process of getting the vaccine should be the first ones in line to get the benefits of it. If that makes me cold-hearted, uh, Greg, then call me up and use Scrooge. Now, it's, it's just amazing. No matter what good news comes, somebody's always got a problem with it. It's tiring. Even some of the most I mean, important news of the year, it's just there's got to be a villain involved. And it's the people that developed it. Well, Greg, you know who did ship uh, something all around the world was China. <laughs> free. They ship the virus all around the world for free. You know, if you, if you really want to get mad at someone, there's somebody you can get mad at. A good deed never goes unpunished, Jim. What can I say? Mm-hmm. All right. Have a good one. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus, Radio America. Do not forget about Jim's fantastic new book, Hunting for Horsemen. Also, please subscribe to the Three Martini Lunch podcast. We are very grateful for your kind reviews and your five-star ratings. Also, you can get us on those home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch podcast. Have a great day, and please join us Thursday for the next Three Martini Lunch.